Dr. Nako Nakatsuka is currently a senior scientist at ETH Zurich. She did her Bachelor of Science in Chemistry at Fordham University, and uh, she did her PhD in Biophysics at UCLA. Her multidisciplinary research is focused on understanding the fundamentals of molecular interactions of DNA-based recognition elements, termed aptimers. And uh, she's going to talk a lot about this today on this podcast. And uh, a couple of interesting facts that I found out about her were she's, she has over 25 publications to her name. And she can speak four languages, uh, Japanese, English, German, and French. Not uh, fully. <laughs> so, so, so. so welcome, Dr. Nakatsuka. How are you doing today? I'm good, thanks. Thanks a lot for having me on your podcast. Thank you for joining. And uh, let's get into the first question, which is what exactly got you into this field that you're in? And what exactly is this field that you're researching in? Mm -hmm. So I got into the realm of bio nanotechnology when I was a bachelor student at Fordham University, actually, and I joined a group at Fordham led by Professor Ipsita Banerjee, and we were working on tissue engineering. And so it's very different from what I work on now, but the reason why I got really passionate about it was because I was doing a lot of sports. I ran for the division one track and field team at Fordham. I was getting injured all the time and uh, tissue engineering was a way to provide a solution to athletes that were getting injured all the time. If you tear a ligament, you can create something new out of these biomaterials that we design. And so that was kind of my first passion of getting into research. Ah, this is something that is applicable to my daily life, something that I would like to see in the world. But then during my PhD, I tackled a very new problem, which was brain research. Um, with the general theme of bio nanotechnology, where we are developing new technologies to address biological problems. And so in terms of my PhD research, what we wanted to do was to monitor neurochemicals. And so our brain communicates both electrically and chemically, and that if you have two brain cells, one of them releases an electrical signal, releases chemicals called neurotransmitters that bind to the next cell, and then that triggers the next electrical signal. But it's really difficult to measure these chemical signals. So we were building tools that allow us to be able to do that. Right. And uh, recently, uh, there was an article about you on MIT Review, uh, which was uh, how I discovered you. Uh, this, this article was about biosensors being able to detect uh, depression and dementia within uh, people. So how did you actually, uh, can you uh, give us an in-depth detail about this research and what exactly mm -hmm. goes on and how it's differentiating between different illnesses? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So... We're not at the point where we can really understand or differentiate diseases yet, but what's so crazy about the realm of neuroscience is that we understand so little about the fundamentals. And so let's say, for example, for depression, there are antidepressants in the drug market, and it doesn't work for a lot of people. There's a lot of side effects, and it's generally because the problem is so simplified and saying there's a very low level of serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter in the brain, Let's use an antidepressant to increase that concentration, but it's not enough. And so there's something missing in our understanding of how these brain diseases work. Um, for Alzheimer's, for Parkinson's, there's so many different aspects to it. There's the, the protein um, aspect where there's a lot of aggregation of proteins that cause issues, but there's also neurotransmitter release that is changed. There's electrical signals that are altered. And what we're really trying to tackle is the basic fundamental understanding of where are these diseases coming from? How can we actually design new drugs or therapeutics to tackle these diseases? And to do that, we really have to start from the bottom up where we can start to measure these chemicals and correlate it um, for different diseases. Right, right. And uh, do these uh, biosensors help in detection of uh, various like mental illnesses specifically like can it detect mm -hmm. Alzi alzheimer's and parkinson's like separately mm -hmm. is it able to differentiate? So, the, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so the key 
is what are the biomarkers for these diseases? And the crazy thing is that's still very much unknown. There are a lot of literature, if you take a look um, for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia in general, but there's so many different hypotheses. For example, that dopamine regulation is important for Parkinson's, maybe a very low level of dopamine correlates to a certain mechanism. So of course, for depression, the most commonly talked about molecule is serotonin. And so we have to start figuring out what to track for different diseases, basically what to monitor, what the different concentration levels mean to be able to start saying, okay, this is a marker of Alzheimer's, for example, this is a marker of Parkinson's. But I think the interesting thing is it's probably quite correlated, actually. There's already a lot of hypotheses in the neuroscience literature that says it's not just one disease or the other. There's actually a lot of connections between them because the brain is so connected. And so the dysregulation of one chemical can actually heavily influence another pathway. Right. And what are these biosensors actually made of? And mm -hmm. where are they so, exactly released into when it comes to like, are they released into the brain directly or how, how does it get into the uh, mm -hmm. areas to detect it, to detect mm -hmm. various illness? So there's yeah. multiple different systems to interrogate. Of course, there's directly inside the brain where then you have to put in something that is implantable. So you can think about it as maybe an acupuncture needle that you can actually insert in precise brain locations and then we have these recognition elements you mentioned called aptamers that bind a specific molecule of interest. And when it binds, it transduces a signal. And so it's an electrical sensor in that we have these DNA molecules. DNA is negatively charged because it has a phosphate backbone. And so when it rearranges upon target capture, you can kind of imagine the shape-shifting object that then rearranges negative charge very close to the surface. And then we can see that as a signal electrically. Strictly. And so the implantables can go directly inside the brain and my PhD work is actually being transformed to these in vivo or in the brain sensors. But my current work as a postdoc and senior scientist at ETH, we've been trying to tackle in vitro systems. So these are much more simplified systems that are outside of the brain, so in vitro. And I developed these tiny pipettes. And so this is actually what the MIT um, Technology Review talked about. Mm -hmm. They're glass capillaries that have approximately 10 nanometer openings. So nanoscale yeah. is very, very small, 10 yeah. to the power of negative nine. Yeah. I think there's always that correlation between it's like a billionth the width of your hair or something. And we confine these mm -hmm. DNA sequences called aptamers inside of these pores. Now it's the same mechanism as before, when the DNA rearranges its confirmation in this structure switching way, we can actually gate the way in which ions move through in solution. So everything around us, including you know the, the Gatorade that you drink or uh, the tea that you drink, everything has these ions, sodium, potassium, chlorine. And when you apply a potential, basically a voltage, you see a migration of those ions, depending on whether they're positive or negative. And what we're detecting is when these ions go through this tiny nanoscale pore, depending on what the aptamer looks like in that pore, we alter the way in which those ions flux or move through that pore. And so yeah. now what's really nice is that these very, very small sensors can get very close to neurons or brain cells in these um, outside of the brain cultures, or you can start to get really close to where they communicate called synapses. And so mm -hmm. synapses are the way in which the neurons communicate. It's a very small gap that's about 20 to 50 nanometers. And so since all of these um, chemical and electrical interactions happen at such a small scale at the nano scale, we have to build tools that approach that dimension, which are these very small pipettes. Right. That sounds so interesting. And how, how exactly are these nano things designed? Like, how do you make it that small? Mm -hmm. So it's actually a very surprising method. We do it in-house in our lab. It's via laser pulling, where you start out with just a normal glass capillary. You heat the center of the capillary with a laser with a certain heat, a certain amount of time, and just pull it. It's kind of like how people make glass capillaries 
uh, structures. You know, they, they heat it and then they can mold it into different shapes. In our case, we pull it with a certain velocity, we heat it with a certain temperature, and then we end up being able to tune the opening at the tip of the pulled glass. <laughs> that sounds extremely interesting. Okay. And uh, when you experiment, before human trials, how mm -hmm. do you actually experiment it? If it works mm -hmm. or not? And so I think there's multiple different steps, of course, that you have to take. The first step is in the lab, in a very simple environment. Let's say you start with a buffer, which is just um, a, a fake environment that you create that is supposed to mimic the future environment. And so it just has sodium, chlorine, all these ions, but it's not necessarily like the human brain or blood. And then you have to validate your sensor there. You have to make sure that it can differentiate similarly structured molecules. That's a big challenge in the brain because there's so many different chemicals that look exactly the same. And so that's why we need these aptamers that can differentiate similarly structured chemicals um, from the way in which they're designed. And then after you validate it in the lab, then you have to move towards more complex systems. OK, now that my sensor works in these um, non-real environments, how does it function inside brain tissue, inside blood, et cetera? And then I think after that's validated, then you go to mouse models. And you can start putting these inserted inside of the brain of mice. Maybe you move on to primates and then maybe to human clinical trials. And so there's a very long um, yeah. journey from the lab to humans, but I think that along the way, there's so many things that we can learn. And uh, which stage have you actually got across so far? Mm -hmm. And so what was really cool about my PhD work was that I started from the very basic lab work of just testing in these fake environments, just developing the sensor from scratch. But then when I left and kind of overlapping as I was leaving, we were able to miniaturize the sensor. We had a really good team that was working on this project who were engineers. They could make these sensors small enough to insert inside the brain of a mouse. And now the group of Anne Andrews Lab at UCLA, we recently have a submitted paper, still not published, but hopefully soon, where we actually do in the brain recordings inside awake mice. I see. Okay. And uh, do these biosensors actually uh, help in sleep monitoring or sleep maintenance? Mm -hmm. So that's or a very good question. And it's, of, yeah, mm -hmm. can they help be helpful? So, neuroscience is such a wide field. And I think that I am definitely not an expert in a lot of the areas. But for example, I have a collaborator that I was talking to where we wanted to design sensors to monitor different um, aspects of Alzheimer's. But actually, she comes from a sleep group where they have certain chemicals that they want to monitor to see whether it correlates with the circadian rhythm, basically how, how your sleep, sleep cycles happen, on what influences that. And so I think that the ability to measure chemicals, um, especially the generalizability of our approach and that we don't necessarily need to just monitor serotonin or dopamine or neurotransmitters, we can monitor other biomarkers, allows us to really tackle um, any problem that might be of use to the neuroscience community. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are some other research that you've been focusing on in your whole PhD uh, life? Mm -hmm. Oh, so a lot. And so I think that's the really fun part. I think that always my main focus has been on the neuroscience in terms of developing new tools for neuroscience. But what's really cool is that once you start understanding how these systems work mechanistically, how do these aptamers actually bind a target? How could we modulate the way in which it functions in different environments, we can start integrating it into any platform we want. So I actually also um, develop point of care sensors. So for example, it's like the, the COVID test where you can just do um, at home testing maybe of some kind of biomarker in blood. Um, you can also do, for example, protein sensing rather than just small molecule sensing for various different applications. Um, my first PhD pro um, project was actually not biosensing, but creating screening substrates to actually discover aptamers. And so to, in order to find aptamers for different targets of interest, you actually have to go through a protocol that allows us to find them in the first place. So 
it's a very multidisciplinary yeah. uh, research area where I think that I've I've touched upon so many different topics, but yeah. the main focus has always been neuroscience. I see. And what are your future plans when it comes to you know developing as a scientist? And what are your future plans when it comes to your work, your research? Mm -hmm. So my future plans, I would like to pursue academia. That's the current track that I am on, um, which means that I would really love to and enjoy supervising students and also teaching. And I think that's a really important area of scientific education. Um, but I think in terms of the research, what I really want to see is the tools that I've developed actually be used by neuroscientists to answer some kind of question. And so you asked at the very beginning, you know, what can you differentiate diseases? Can you actually, you know, monitor disease progression? Can you detect early onset? These are questions that I want answered. But to do so, there are so many specialized groups around the world who are very focused on answering one question, let's say, what is the onset of Alzheimer's or where does depression come from and how is it modulated? And my hope is that I can give these groups my sensors that I've developed and say, go forth and try to answer your questions. <laughs> uh, that sounds very fun. And uh, yes, um, yeah, that, that was a really interesting talk. Uh, you've shared so much information. There was so much to do with nanos, uh, nanotechnology, so much to do with bio and uh, it was just so informative so fun to talk to you, thank you. so thank you for joining us uh, dr nako today see you thanks a lot